now I'd like to con consider another process uh, of evolution through which the Montessori teacher goes, and that is the evolution of teacher as class manager. So we go to training. We have the image in our minds. We have the ideal exquisitely laid out. Build it and they will come. Offer lessons and they will learn. Prepare the environment and peace will reign. <laughs> Or in some cases, I know that you don't have access to training. Perhaps you're just reading Montessori's words. Couldn't be any more elevating than doing that in terms of anticipating what you will experience on day one. But I'll let you in on a little secret. Regardless of training or no training, internship or no internship, we all start out here. <laughs> this is the first year at a minimum just staying alive. If we can keep, up, keep ourselves from being tied up by the children, a good day has been had. At the end of the day, home to bed for teacher. Maybe dinner first, maybe not. But Friday nights out on the town, like in the past? <laughs> not likely. I had never been so tired in my life than the first years of teaching. But eventually, hopefully, we get some things figured out. And we can actually start to notice some things in our own class, be it during mobile observation or any one of the many stages. And at this point, teachers typically evolve and begin to fixate on the little naughties. We call this kind of kid cute from afar, but far from cute. <laughs> For the next stage as class manager, we become consumed with the children who are misbehaving. We become completely convinced that they are the cause of all of our woes. If it weren't for those few children, my class would be. But what takes a few years to truly accept is that when one little naughty moves on, another takes her place. <laughs> they are like shark's teeth. I don't know if you know that, but when one tooth is lost in a shark attack, another row behind just steps right up. So, let's see. Where are we then? Naughty children are part of the package, and they actually have much to offer you and to the children, but that's a discussion for another time. Again, hopefully you continue to grow and learn, and eventually we figure out how to work with these little less civilized ones, <laughs> and we're on to the next stage, and we become completely consumed with a new group, the poor little ones who don't learn so easily. <laughs> They don't seem to be getting information that was designated in our lessons as the direct purpose, let alone the indirect preparation. <laughs> Let's just say that lessons of the number rods with these children have a very long shelf life. These are the children from, for whom you take a deep breath before you take out the sandpaper letters, because you know that those same three letters will be no more familiar today than the other 23 they've never seen before. But if we work hard, if we get some help, if we seek counsel and have a lot of faith, eventually we get to hear. Well, I never actually got to hear. Perhaps you couldn't tell my irreverence. I never was radiant or radiant light never shone around me. I didn't color coordinate and sit ladylike in splendor next to a little angel <laughs> who was sitting in equal poise and grace. But the picture's so beautiful and um, the vision is there. So a place to aspire. So the final question then is how do we get from here <laughs> to here? <laughs> And now I'd like to touch for a few minutes on the necessity of mentoring. The reality is that without some good mentoring, many, most, or even nearly all of us will get stuck at one of those stages as class manager. Each has the potential to be a showstopper and a career killer, because these earlier stages are exhausting. I know that you all have different access to, or lack of access maybe, in some cases, to mentors. Some likely not at all, but I say in this day of video and internet and all kinds of communication, a determined teacher can still get some. 